Okay, uh, great. Um, welcome to the class. Um, today we have a super exciting lecture uh, where you will learn a lot. It will be a very thrilling lecture with lots of surprises, um, very emotional, and there'll be an important life advice as part of this lecture as well. So uh, wait and see. Okay, so we are talking today about latent factor recommender systems. Um, and this means we will be talking about kind of these ideas coming from singular value decomposition, but applied to uh, recommender systems, and how do we make the entire thing work. Um, so here is what the problem we'll, uh, we'll face today is. So uh, a few years ago, Netflix uh, released this challenge called the Netflix Prize. And uh, what they gave out was a half a, mi uh, sorry, 100 million different movie user ratings, right? So for about half a million people on about 18,000 movies, we have 100 million ratings. Um, and this was six years of data from the year 2000 to the year 2005. Um, and uh, basically, the, what they did is, um, this was your training data, and based on this, this training data, the idea was to build a recommender engine. And then they also came up with this test data, which was basically composed of the last few ratings of each of these uh, users, and uh, they have about 2.8 million of these test set ratings. They said, uh, here is the evaluation criteria. What you want to do is minimize the sum of the squared errors. So the idea is, this is your prediction of how much, what is the rating between one and five stars of user X on movie I. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, this is the ground truth. This is your prediction. You want to go over all the, all the ratings in the test set and compute the, the root mean square error. Uh, at that point in time, the Netflix had a system in production that was off, that whose root mean square error was, error was 0.95. And uh, they organized a competition that more than 2,700 different teams participated in. Um, and whoever could improve this number by 10% would score a million dollars. Okay? So what we'll go today through is, what were these 2,700 teams doing? And how did they solve this problem? And who won a million dollars? Okay, so that's the that's the plan for today. Here is how uh, the data was given to us. All right. So essentially, there was this training set of data, which was this hundred million ratings, right? And we can think of this as a matrix of um, all the all the movies and all the users. And an entry at a given cell tells me how much a given user liked a given movie. And this was the data that was released. Then what Netflix held privately was a set of 3 million ratings, which they split into two parts. They had 1.5 million ratings that they called this squish set. So whenever you built a model here, you submitted it to Netflix. Netflix would evaluate it, evaluate it on this uh, set of data and post you on the leaderboard. Okay? And then at the end, when kind of for the final evaluation of the competition, they had this test set and they would only use this final test set to determine the winner. Okay, so they used this quiz set for you to give, once you build the model, to get the feedback how well you are doing. And then once kind of the competition is over, they would run the models on this um, hidden test set to determine the final winner. Okay, that's the, that's the setting. So now let's look at how did they, what was happening with these 100 million uh, ratings, right? So what this means is that basically you were given a matrix where you have 18,000 rows. Each row is a different movie and you have half a million columns. Uh, each column is a different uh, user, a different customer, and you are given 100 non-zero elements, right? Even though 100 may seem a lot to you, this is actually little because, you know, this is what? 10 to the 4, that is 10 to the 5. So this, um, uh, this matrix has, I don't know, uh, billions of entries. So in some sense, the, end, the matrix is very sparse. It's full of zeros. And even though you are given 100 million known zeros, it's mostly empty. So, but that is our data. It's about for every user, how did they rate the movies? And then, as I said before, how is the evaluation done? How are we measuring success? One way to think of this is the following. The way to think of it is that, you know, you are given the yellow part of the matrix and you'd like to, to guess some other cells entries of this matrix. And the idea is that, right, out of 
this particular matrix, you would kind of mask out some known ratings. Let's say this, this ratings here, right in my gray part. And the question is, how well can you guess them? And then what you want to do is measure the difference between your predicted value in this cell versus the true value in the cell. And the way you measure the discrepancy, as I mentioned early on, is through the root mean square error, where basically the idea is, is that you go over all the, all these test cases. This is the predicted rating for a given uh, user for a given item minus the true rating, whatever is truly in this cell. And you take the difference, square it, sum up over, over all these entries, um, take a square root, and divide by the number of uh, entries in your test set. And this is called root mean square error, right? So essentially, it's a, you know, it's a quadratic distance between what your prediction was and what the truth was. And we would like this to be as small as possible. Right now, the, the Netflix system does this with 0.95 uh, is the root mean square error, and we'd like to bring it down to about 0.85, so 10, 10 percentage points uh, lower, okay? So that's, that's the task, this is what we'd like to do. In some sense, we'd like to predict the known ratings without us ever looking at them, okay? So um, now that we know what we wanna do, is I'll talk to you about the winning uh, solution for, for, uh, for this team. The winning team was called Belcor by the last names of the, of the two leaders. Um, and I'll tell you what kind of their approach was to do this. Um, and they were the winner of the Netflix challenge. So I'll show you a nice photo of them with a million dollar check at the end. So you see it was real. Um, and the way they approach this is to have this intuition of this kind of multi-scale modeling of the data, where they say that they want to kind of model top level global effects, local kind of regional effects, as well as very local fine grained view of the data. So, you know, the way they visualize this is to say, oh, there is some global effects, there are some kind of uh, regional effects, and there are very local effects that I want to capture. And um, what do they mean by global? The, I'll, I'll make this more precise later. You can think of, you know, overall deviations of how good is the movie overall, how strict is the user overall, this is what is called global. Then they say uh, this regional level, they call it factorization. So this will be kind of um, uh, singular value decomposition. We'll talk about this. And then collaborative filtering that Michele talked about on Tuesday is for this like very fine grained interactions at very local scale. And we'll see how to integrate all this into the best performing um, recommender engine. First, let me tell you what do we mean by global effects. And here is how you could simply measure global effects, right? So you could say, for example, you know, um, you want to make a prediction how much Joe will like the Sixth Sense movie, right? So the way you could do this is to say, mean average movie rating in my data set is 3.7. Um, I know that uh, Sixth Sense average rating is, um, um, total rating, the average rating is half a star higher than 0.37. But I know that Joe tends to be a critical person, so he rates uh, 0.2 stars below the average, right? So now, what would be my baseline estimation? My estimation would be that Joe will rate the Sixth Sense movie four stars. How do I get to four stars? I say global average is 3.5. Sixth sen six Sense is half a star better than the global average, but Joe is 0.2 stars more critical than the global average. I add these things together, that's my prediction for how much um, Joe is going to rate six cents, okay? And this is what I mean by global effect. It's basically overall, what's the average rating? Overall, what's the average rating for six cents? And what's the ra average rating for Joe? And I combine these numbers, and here is my prediction. So very kind of, very global, very kind of averaged out, yes. Plus the above average, just the sixth sense of the original rating. So why are we just using the original rating? Ah, uh -huh, why do we say so? Because I want to under I want to have a baseline, and the baseline is rating over all the movies in the database. And then I want to say how much better is six cents than that. So that's the so basically, if I would just ask what's the average rating of six cents is is uh, three point seven plus zero point five, right? And then I would ask what is the average rating on Joe is 3.7 minus 0.2, right? But because I create this baseline, I can work with these deviations. That's, 
the practical reason why we do it this way. Uh, but essentially, the idea is this is just kind of global. So now that this is global, let's talk about um, how do I do very local neighborhood level things, right? So I told you about this. I'll tell you next about that. And then we'll go to factorization. OK, so one, two, three. OK, or one, three, two. OK, sorry. Great. So what do we mean by we talked about collaborative filtering, right? And the way you could do collaborative filtering is to say, oh, but Joan, Joe didn't like this related movie called Science. So you know maybe I should uh, push my uh, rating down a bit, right? So rather than say the rating is 4, my final estimate is the rating is 3.8, OK? Somehow, based on the relationship between movie science and the movie uh, Sixth Sense, I push down the rating a bit. OK? And I'll explain now how would you do this. So this is a recap of collaborative filtering, right? So collaborative filtering in this competition was the earliest and by far the most uh, popular method. And the idea is that I want to derive unknown ratings from those of similar movies, of similar items, right? This is what is called item-item collaborative filtering, as we discussed on Tuesday, right? And the way collaborative filtering works is that you have to define some similarity measure between items. This SIJ tells me how related two items are. And then the idea is, how does this work, is to say, let me take um, k nearest neighbors. Let me k find k nearest items, k, k most similar items to my item i. So most k most similar movies to my sixth sense. And then um, I want to, based on that, I want to compute the rating. How do I compute the rating? I create this set n. I'll index it as i semicolon x, which is these are the items that are most similar to item i, but they were also rated by my user x. OK, so I want to predict how much does x like item i. So I say, what are other items that are similar to i, but were also rated by x? OK? Yeah, give me some. Yes, OK. So how do I now compute the rating? I say my prediction of how much user uh, i, uh, sorry, user x will like the item i is simply the similarity between item i and item j, right? I go over all the item j that are similar to i, but x also rated them. And then I say, how much did x like that item j? And this is the similarity between i and j, right? And then, you know, I normalize out by the sum of the similarities. But essentially, what am I doing? I'm saying, here is the sixth sense. What are the most similar movies to sixth sense that my user X has watched? And now I'm doing some kind of weighted average, weighted sum of those ratings, where the weight is proportional to the similarity between I and J, right? <coughs> and last time, we talked about how can you define this similarity metric. We talked about Jacquard. We talked about the Spearman correlation, and so on and so forth, right? But the point is that I say my predicted rating for this Joe on a given item is simply I find other items J that are similar to the item I'm interested in. I, those items have to be rated by, by Joe. And then I'm basically asking how similar are the items times how much did the Joe like those similar items, OK? And that's what is essentially collaborative filtering. Now, the way you really implement collaborative filtering is you don't implement this formula. What you implement is the following formula. And the way you, and this is what is now this doing. It's taking this local and global effects and putting them together. So the idea is that you want to have this global baseline estimate that I was telling you about before. And then you have this correction factor that comes from collaborative filtering. Um, but the, the important thing is that you are not, that here, you are now predicting, you are modeling deviations rather than the absolute values. OK, right? So now, what is the, the baseline estimate? The baseline estimate is what I have already explained you three slides ago, right? So the baseline estimate for user x and item i is the global average plus the deviation for user x plus the de deviation for item i. So this was my Joe and six cents up and down 0 0.3, 0 0.7 stars, right? So overall average, rating deviation for the user, and then rating deviation for the item. And that's my global estimate. And then when I do the collaborative filtering up here, 
I still go over all the items j that are similar to i and were rated by x. I still have the similarity, but the difference happens here where I have the rating of x uh, to, uh, to this similar item j, but then I say minus the baseline estimate of uh, uh, how much x we like item j. So essentially, not what I'm now saying is how much did user x's rating deviate from what the baseline prediction would be? And now I'm kind of averaging or summing together this baseline, uh, uh, these deviations. And that turns out to work much better in practice because you are focusing your predictive power here on modeling deviations rather than modeling absolute values, right? So, um, before maybe I go through this, are there any questions? Is this, is this clear what we do? Right? So this is how you would implement this in practice if, you know, you get a job tomorrow and you have to build a recommender system. So this would be, you know, my first step. Yes? Great. Exactly. Super question. How are similarities based? Similarities would be based the way we des describe them in, in your, in the, on, on Tuesday. So or based on original ratings, right? So what are some problems? Here are some problems with this approach. First approach is that these similarities are kind of arbitrary, right? You can pick some similarity metric and you hope you pick the good one. Um, the other thing is that these pairwise similarities kind of capture relationships between items, but neglect interdependencies between users. And then the last thing is that taking this weighted average, this, you know, where you take this uh, SIJ weights, is kind of seems to be a bit restrictive. So what we want to do is that instead of having this similarity scores SIJs, we will try to use some weights WIJs. Okay, so so far SIJ is the similarity, but I'll throw away SIJs, but I will use some different WIJs. Okay, so this SIJ up there, I will replace it with WIJ. So now I need to tell you what the, what the idea is, right? So the idea is that I will re, uh, rewrite my uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, I have exactly the same thing as I had before. The only thing happens here is that I throw away this guy. Uh, the sum is still the same, and I replace the SIJ on the top with WIJ, right? So the only difference essentially is that WIJ, right? And um, what are, so just to explain, N NIX is still a set of movies rated by, by user X that are similar to movie I using some similarity function. But now WIJs are what we will call interpolation weights, right? They are some real numbers. And I don't really care what they are. They don't have to sum to one. They are just some arbitrary weights. And these weights tell me in some sense how much does movie J influence movie I, okay? And, right, so the idea is that these WIJs model the interactions between pairs of movies, um, and that this interaction doesn't depend on the user X. Of course, what I have to do now is to figure out how am I going to figure out the values of this WIJ, okay? So, what we just did is to say, let's still do collaborative filtering in a sense that we have to find the most similar movies, but when we compute the, when we combine the ratings from the, from the similar movies, we don't, uh, uh, the difference is up here, right? We don't um, uh, aggregate them based on the similarity, but we'll aggregate them based on some arbitrary weight WIJ, okay? So now the question will be, how do I figure out what WIJ is, okay? So here is our reasoning, okay? Um, this is important, right? So what do we want to do? Our goal is to minimize the root mean square error, right? So we want to minimize the sum of the squared differences between the prediction and the truth, right? Then another thing you should observe is that, you know, uh, for a given data set, one over size of r, which is size of the data sets, that just, that's just a constant. So who cares? The square root, I can throw away because square root is a monotonic transformation. So what does this mean is that the model that will minimize the root mean square error will minimize the sum of the squared errors. Okay? 
So whatever minimizes the sum of squared errors minimizes the root mean square error because square root is just a monotone transformation and one over r is the size of the data set, so it's a constant. So whatever, so whatever minimizes, whatever predictions minimize this also minimize the root mean square error, right? So essentially what I want is I want to find the predictions that minimize the sum of the squared errors. So what can I do now? I can say, huh, I'll be smart. I'll find wij's such that they minimize the sum of the squared errors on the training data, right? So basically I'm saying, you give me some ratings, I'll figure out what wij is so that I can predict those known ratings as well as possible, okay? Um, so the idea is that I will use training data to learn or estimate this uh, wij's uh, based, based on the data, okay? So now you could say, good, okay, you can go do this, be my guest, but who cares about training data? I don't care about minimizing the sum of square errors on the training data. I want to minimize it on this test data that is outside that I haven't yet seen. So how do we, how do we do that? Okay, so here is our reasoning, and this is essentially the reasoning that all of supervised machine learning depends on. And if this reasoning doesn't, doesn't go through, then none of the machine learning works, okay? So what's the fundamental reasoning? The reasoning is the following, right? We say, we will quantify the goodness of our recommendations using root mean square error or sum of the squared errors, right? So it means that the lower the root mean square error, the better recommendations we have, we have developed. Then we can say that, you know, we want to make good recommendations on the items that users hasn't yet seen. That's our goal. Right, so I want to predict what movies are you going to like tomorrow. Nobody knows that, probably not even you, right? So I cannot really do that, right? There's no way for me to minimize the error for tomorrow. It's a, I can simply cannot do that. Nobody can do that, right? We don't know what will happen tomorrow. So what can I do? I can say, let me build a system so that it works well on the known user item rating, meaning I would be happy if, you know, I could, after you have seen the movie and gave the rating, I can now predict the same rating. So I'd be happy to be able to reconstruct user item ratings for the user item pairs I have already seen, right? And this hope, and then what do I hope? I hope that if I can do this well on the known data, this system will hope, hopefully work well on the unknown ratings. It will hopefully work well tomorrow, right? And this hope is called generalization, right? I'd like to use my training data to predict well the ratings on the training data, and then I hope that my system will generalize into the future, into the unknown ratings. And all of machine learning worries about this hope, about how do I generalize into the future? And we will have to worry about this um, as well. But for now, let's just worry, can we predict known ratings, okay? So back to W, what do we want? We want to set the values for Ws in such a way that they will work well, so it means they will predict well the known user item ratings, okay? So the way I can now um, do this is to say, how do I find Ws that will predict the known ratings well? The idea is to define an objective function and then solve the, object, the optimization problem. So let's define the, the, the objective function so that I can then solve this objective function, let's say minimize it, and find the best value of W, right? So we said, let's find Wij such that it minimizes the sum of the squared errors on training data. So here is now my objective function, I'll call it J, it depends on W, and then here is now this monstrosity of equation, but it's really simple. I go over all my training data. Uh, this big thing here is my prediction for how much user X is going to like item I. This is exactly the equation we had before, right? That's the baseline rating. These are the most similar movies, uh, J. Here is my WIJ. How much did the user X like the movie J? Minus the baseline rating uh, for um, X and the movie J, right? So that's my predicted rating for user I on item, uh, sorry, for user X on item I. And then minus my true rating. Squared, that's my sum of the squared uh, errors, 
Okay? So now that I have written this out, it may look ugly, but it's really just a quadratic function. Right? It couldn't be simpler. Right? And this quadratic function depends on w because everything else is given. This I know how to compute. This set is given. This is given. This is given. That is given. The only thing that is variable is this w. So how, now what I want to think is solve for w. Solve for this vector or a matrix of numbers. So how do I, how do I solve equations like this numerically? Um, I want to basically ski, right? I ski into the valley until I stop. So how, how, for those who are skiers, how you do this? You find the direction where the slope is the, the steepest and you go down and hopefully you don't fall. Okay? So what would be a, a simple way to minimize a function is to compute the derivative, right? To start at some point, compute the derivative, uh, the gradient of that function at that point, and then make a step in the opposite direction and keep doing that until we get stuck at the bottom. Right? And this is how I can numerically optimize this function. Right? Um, now, my function that I showed you has this nice quadratic structure, so it really looks like this. It looks like a bowl in many dimensions, but, you know, it looks like this. So I can start at some random point and then speed, basically move in the opposite direction of the gradient and I'll find the optimal solution. Okay? So now let's do this. So the next two slides are a bit dense, but I want them dense because you'll need to implement this yourself and this will be very useful for you. Okay, so what do I want to do? I want to identify these interpolation weights, and I want I want to do them using uh, gradient descent. And gradient descent is a very simple iterative algorithm. Um, I give you the the essence of it here, where basically I'm, I have some estimate of my w, and then I compute the gradient, the derivative of my function j with respect to w, and then I make a step of size eta in the opposite direction. And this gives me the new w, and then I can again re reiterate, right? Um, and that's it, right? So what is the gradient? Gradient is nothing else than the derivative evaluated at a particular fixed point, right? At a particular estimate of w. So now, if I show you what is the derivative or the gradient of j with respect to w, right? So what I'm really taking is my function j, um, and I take a partial derivative with respect to a particular wij, right? My w is in some sense a matrix of this uh, ij entries, and I take uh, the derivative with respect to the wij of this uh, function uh, 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 w of j up here, right? That's what I take derivative of, right? So, you know, it's a quadratic function, so I get this two here, then there is a sum. Um, this, is, this is my prediction. Um, um, here is, here are my, uh, because nothing changes in here because this is over wik, but I'm taking the derivative with respect to wij. Um, here is the difference. And the only thing that, that I need to worry about is to take the derivative here. And the only, the only of these entries that will survive is the entry wij here. So the only thing I have to take is take this thing and put it, put it, put it here for the, uh, for the entry x and item j. And that's it, right? So that is my uh, derivative with respect to uh, wij, right? Um, and this, this, is, this will be, uh, this will take this value for all the j's that are in the nearest neighbor set, and for every other j, the value of the derivative will be zero, or the gradient will be zero, right? So now I can do this uh, to compute the gradient with respect to a part particular wij and do the update. Right? The way I would really implement this is that I would fix movie i. I would go over all uh, 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 ratings, over all users who rated movie i, and then for every uh, movie j in the in the uh, in the nearest, uh, the, uh, for every movie j that is similar to i and was and was rated by a given x, I would compute the derivative of the gradient of j with respect to wij and do the update, right? So, and here is my uh, gradient descent function. Basically, I have the old estimate of w, I have the new estimate of w. If the value of w changes uh, more than some epsilon, then I, uh, I basically take, I 
save my old, and then I take my old minus the, the, the gradient with respect to the old to get the new one, and I ask how much did it change? If it changed more than epsilon, I do another iteration. And I keep doing this until W stops changing, right? And the, the parameter eta here, that's the learning rate. It tells me how big step do I take. So it's like step size, okay? So this is how um, gradient descent uh, would, uh, would work, right? So what is cool about this? What is cool is that this wij weights are derived based on the data and are, are not derived based on some arbitrary similarity method, right? They are really the optimal set of weights that minimizes the loss function, the error function we care about, rather than being some similarities that we somehow made, came up with, right? Um, and this way that we explicitly learn the interrelationships among the neighboring movies, right? So what I told you now is the global, how do we model global effects and how do we do this collaborative nearest neighbor effect where we actually go and learn up here this interpolation weights wij, okay? So what I will explain next is this middle uh, ground where we will use factorization. Will we use support um, uh, singular value decomposition? Before I do that, I will just kind of show you how we are doing, right? We still want to win the competition. So what this is trying to show you is uh, how are we making progress towards a million dollars, right? So for example, if our prediction would always just predict the average global rating, then our error uh, up here would be, you know, 1.13. If I would go and predict the user average, it would be, you know, 1.065. If I would only go to predict movie, Average, it would be 1.0533. If I would, um, and this is where the current Netflix system is at 0.95, right? So they are doing a bit better than predicting averages. If we would just do the basic collaborative filtering with uh, similarity scores SIJ, our error would be 0.94. So we would already beat whatever Netflix had in production. If we use the the collaborative filtering plus these global biases plus the learned interpolation scores, we get to 0.91, okay? Um, and what we need to do is we need to close this gap and get to 0.85. This is whoever gets below here wins the million dollars. We are right now up here. We got quite a sizable benefit uh, over what Netflix has, but still we need to move quite, uh, quite a bit lower. Okay, uh, questions, yes. Uh, how was it decided? It was, it was somehow decided, uh, nobody knows. Uh, it turns out it was decided luckily, amazingly luckily well. Right, it's very hard to know how, how low can you make it. If you put it here, they could put it up here and it'd be trivial. They could put it somewhere down here, nobody would get to it and everyone would give up. But as it turns out, Somehow this was just the right thing. I'll show you later, right? I, I talked to the people, nobody gave me a good answer, why, why? But they somehow said, here is, here is where the, the magic happens. 10%, yes? It seems like uh, this method transformed the uh, recommender system from an unsupervised problem into a supervised problem. So, um, uh, so is, is that really the case how we can transform to this? Great, so, so it's a clever observation, right? The collaborative filtering is kind of, you don't use any training, it, you don't use any supervised signal. You just kind of design the system, you understand it. What we did here is we took the collaborative filtering, but we added learn, machine learning to it. We added optimization to it, and we said, let's come up with the optimal set of weights. And that, you know, bought us about three percentage points. Uh, um, and you know, if you if you know exactly what your error function is, which here was the root mean square error, which we can debate long time why that is a bad uh, a bad error metric, but you know it was chosen. Then if you know what the error metric is, yes, then you should go and optimize that. In reality, you don't know what the error metric is. You know, your user happiness is the error metric. How do you measure user happiness? There is a lot of different ways, right? In some sense, you always have. Mm -hmm. 
You have the label, but right, like even think about Netflix. Netflix doesn't care to make good recommendations to you. What really Netflix cares is for you not to cancel your subscription. And if they believe that they can, they can make you not cancel the subscription by giving you crappy recommendations, they'll give you crappy recommendations. Because I know you will hope, you will keep your subscription to say, oh, maybe tomorrow they give me a good one. I don't know, right? But the point is, the real met, I mean, at the end, the real business metric for Netflix is the number of subscribers. And maybe the root mean square error, you know, if they minimize that, will lead to more subscribers. Hopefully it will. But at the end, it's subscribers that matter, right? So that's why I'm saying that in real life, you want something that's beyond these very well measured predictions. But it's very hard to get there. Yes? Interpolation weights on um, n, which is the neighbors, but yeah. and then we define the error on r, which is the whole set. But then at some point, we haven't figured out how do we learn n. It just n is this magic function of this. A great observation. So I, I, I go back and explain. So you are making this observation that, you know, we are able to learn this w, right? But this n is arbitrary. That's correct. But the point is, I the way I solve the problem is that I just make n big enough so that these w's can go to zero, right? So if I make n big enough, then, you know, it has to include the kind of the relevant neighborhood. And then if some movie does not influence, it will just learn uh, to put a zero here, right? So, so n can be relatively arbitrary because w will decide which of those neighbors it really likes and which ones don't matter. So the choice of n is less crucial than the choice of w. w can compensate for whatever mistakes you have in n, right? So. Um, can we just remove n? So the idea would be that you would just sum up over everything, all the movies. Uh, you could sum up over all the movies, but then the problem is that now you took your learning problem and you have to estimate 18,000 squares different, squares different parameters. And uh, that's not necessarily the smartest thing to do and the easiest thing to do, right? So you don't want to do that because then it blows up and you overfit, right? But good points, great points. Thank you for thinking it through. Okay, right. so now the intermediate thing, which is the, um, the SVD part, the, the latent factor modeling part. And the idea is, right, that we want to take our uh, movies and our users and embed them, project them into some low dimensional space so that kind of people who like particular movies are kind of located together in this space, right? So, you know, somebody might like Dumb and Dumber, and Independence Day, and you know, a well-educated doctor really likes The Lion King and things like that, right? So that's kind of the idea. And the way we will do this is to create these latent factors. A and essentially, the idea is to take this user rating utility matrix R and do singular value decomposition of it. What does this mean is that we wanna take R and uh, uh, write it out as a product of two matrices, matrix Q and uh, matrix P. So the idea is that, you know, I will take this matrix and decompose it as a product of two matrices where the matrix Q has the rows corresponding to items and a set has a set of columns. We will call these columns factors. And then, you know, the, the matrix P has all the users and again, the same number of factors. So in this case, we would come up with three factors, right? So now, for now, let's assume that we can approximate the utility matrix, the matrix, uh, the, the rating matrix R as a product of these two thin matrices P and Q. There is one important caveat is that R has missing entries, right? It has these missing entries. And if you would just blindly apply singular value decomposition to this, then all these missing entries was, would be treated as zeros. And you would be evaluating your reconstruction error over those zeros as well. And we don't wanna do this. I think somebody asked me this like two lectures ago or something when I was discussing SVD. So the point is we cannot just apply SVD because SVD um, cares about the reconstruction error over the entire matrix. But what we care about is 
all, all about the reconstruction error only over the yellow cells of the matrix, right? And we want to ignore the missing part. So now imagine, uh, imagine you can do this decomposition. How would you make the prediction? The way you would make the prediction is that for a given user and an item, you would say, oh, I want a given item. I want a given user. And you would simply take the corresponding vector Q and the corresponding vector P and do the dot product between them, right? So give you an example. You want to make a prediction at this red cell. How much will the you know user number uh, five like the movie number two? So the idea is you take the second movie, you take the fifth user, here are the factors, you do the dot product between these two vectors, and uh, here you get the value, 2.4. Uh, and that's your prediction, OK? So this is how this would work, right? Uh, I come up with these factors. For any user movie pair, I multiply the factors. It gives me the, it gives me the number, right? And the way you can think of these, these factors, right? I have three factors here, and I, I have three factors here. You can think of this as a representation, as an embedding, as a point uh, that represents a user now in three-dimensional space. So you can think of this um, the, the following way, right? You can say, aha, uh -huh, here is factor number one. Here is factor number two. This would be factor number three. And now every, every, every movie is a point in this three-dimensional space, right? And then similarly, every user is also a point in this three-dimensional space. And what you want is you want, uh, because you are doing the dot product, you are doing in some sense cosine similarity, you want uh, users to be close to the movies they like, right? So this way, you kind of embed uh, movies uh, and, and users into the same space. So now, the question is, how do we compute this embedding? OK, how do we do this? So let me first tell you how singular value decomposition would do this. And then we'll figure out why it's does, it doesn't really apply in our case, and how do we fix it, right? So last week, I think on Thursday, we talked about singular value decomposition where we said, I can take my data matrix A, and I can decompose it as a product of three skinny matrices, U, sigma, and V transpose. I, uh, sigma is diagonal. Uh, it has, um, uh, s uh, it's a matrix of singular vectors that are greater than 0. Um, and then columns, uh, columns of U and uh, rows of V transpose are orthonormal, meaning each one, each column has a Euclidean length one, and it's orthogonal to all other uh, columns of U and all other rows of V transpose, right? So now if I would do, if I would take my, uh, if I would want to apply this SVD to my use case, uh, here is what I could do, right? In order to get my R equals uh, Q times P transpose, I could simply say my rating matrix uh, is my matrix A. You know, for matrix Q, I will take the U from SVD. And for P transpose, I will take sigma times W transpose, right? And I'm kind of done, right? I have my Q, and I have my P, and I compute them based on the singular value decomposition, right? And uh, it seems we are kind of done. The, the reason why is SVD a good thing to do in this case is the following, right? We remember that SVD optimizes the objective function that we want, right? SVD minimizes the sum of the squared errors, right? So SVD is the optimal thing to, to solve this equation, right? SVD gives me the solution to this equation, right? It finds u, v, and sigma that minimize the sum of the squared errors, the sum of the squared reconstruction errors, right? The true entry minus the reconstructed entry. So it's exactly what we want for our Netflix challenge, right? What, there are two things to note. First one is, as I explained already before, that root mean square error uh, in, in the Netflix challenge and the sum of the squared errors are monotonically uh, related. So it means if I uh, minimize the sum of the squared errors, I have minimized root mean square error. So in some sense, Singular value decomposition is minimizing the root mean square error, which is what we want, right? This is the 
the, the error metric of the Netflix challenge, but there is a complication, is that this sum in the SVD error term, this sum is over all the entries of the matrix, and the no rating is interpreted as the zero rating. So basically, this error term goes over all the entries, also the missing entries, right? And our R has missing ratings, so this is not, you cannot just apply SVD. You have to come up with specialized methods that will essentially compute SVD. So um, let me just, just summarize. Um, the idea was the following. I take my uh, rating matrix here. I write it as a, a product of two matrices, Q and uh, P transpose. Um, I decide on the number of latent factors, number of columns of Q. And uh, what, we, what we decided is that SVD is minimizing the, the sum of the squared errors, which is the error function we care about. But it's doing this over all the entries, also over the missing entries of R. So this is not what we want. So how do we proceed? We develop specialized methods for identifying P and Q. The way we do this is to say, I want to find P and Q that minimize the following function that says, let me go over all the ratings I have. Here is my true rating minus my predicted rating. And the same way as we said, let's find Wij before, I'm now saying, let's find P and Q such that this, when I multiply these two things together, I get the rating I want, right? Um, so a few more things to note. In our case, when we solve this, we don't require the columns of P, o, P, P, P and Q to be orthogonal or unit length. We don't care anymore, right? So we don't have these constraints of singular value decomposition. Still, P and Q will map users and movies to this latent space, to this using these latent factors. Um, and uh, this kind of matrix factorization, where you take the, you, the rating matrix and you factorize it into a product of two matrices, was the most popular model uh, in the Net Netflix uh, challenge. So this idea was kind of the most popular at the end. Okay? So um, are there any questions at this point? Just checking. Okay, yes. I don't know if you mentioned this. Are P and Q both guaranteed to still be unique in this case? Uh, they are not guaranteed to be unique. If you think about this, this problem now is not even convex anymore. The reason it's not convex is because this is unknown and that is unknown. So you have a product of two unknowns. So you, it's no guarantees. Great question. Great point. Yes. I and X in R now is over. Can you so, speak up? So the sum over I and X in R now is only over the ones you have data on. Correct. Exactly. So this sum is not over all the entries, but it's only over the entries that you actually have. So this is not, this is only over the yellow part of the matrix, not over everything. Because the, the white cells are undefined. We don't know what they are. Right? So it's only over the data, over the ratings I have. Great point. Good, thank you for the questions. Good, so let's now talk a bit more how do we find these uh, latent factors. Um, let, let me now tell you, right? Our goal is to, to solve, to find P and Q that minimize the following equation, right? Again, they, they minimize the sum of the squared errors between the truth and the prediction, right? And uh, as I said, this, uh, these errors only go over the yellow entries that are given and this white entries, they are missing. So we, our error doesn't go through, right? And we do the same thing as we did before, right? We want, we want, our goal is to minimize the sum of squared errors on unseen test data. We don't see the test data, so we cannot do that. So we will minimize the sum of squared errors on the training data. We will uh, select some number of latent factors k. Going back, we will decide on how many columns do we want these matrices P and Q to have? You know, it's some parameter, 5, 10, 20, however you want. Um, and, uh, and then we will, we will run our optimization, our gradient descent method, to find the best uh, values for, um, for, P and Q, uh, for Q and P. If you do that, then it turns out that um, 
as you increase the value of k, um, you are able to predict known ratings better and better and better and better, which is what we want. But if you then apply this to some holdout test set data, something you know, but you hidden away from yourself, then the error on the test set in also increases, right? So what this means is that on the training set, your error goes down, but on the test set, the error goes up. And this is a classical example of what is called overfitting, where you are fitting your training data so well that you are fitting all these little noisy type things, and when you go to the data that you haven't yet seen, you are making big mistakes. And in practice, what this means is that your model has too much freedom, it has too many parameters, so the model starts fitting noise. And this means that the model fits well on the training data, but does not generalize well to the unseen data, right? So we have to now force our model to generalize well. We kind of have to force it to not use all the freedom we give it, okay? That's, that's the intuition. So how do we, how do we kind of force the model not to, not to overfit? And the technique to do that is called regularization. So let me now explain what regularization is, All right? The idea for regularization is that I want the model to be rich, to use a lot of its expressive power where there is a lot of data. But if the data is, is not present at a given part of the space, I want the model to be very conservative, okay? So the way I do this is now by solving the following equation. It's long, but it, I will explain and it will make a lot of sense, right? So now my, my, my objective function to solve is some combination of what is my predictive error, right? This is prediction minus the truth. This is what we had before. But then I added this other term that I call the length term. It says, oh, wh how long is the row uh, X and how long is the uh, column Q, right? So I'm just asking, what's the Euclidean length of a particular, uh, uh, co uh, 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 this is a row in P and a particular column in Q, right? This, this two, right? Um, and this lambda two and lambda one is what I will call regularization parameters. And they are kind of offsetting about how well do I fit the training data versus how long uh, are these two vectors. And when I say how long they are, it basically means how big weights are along these latent factors, right? So if I were to set lambdas to zero, my model would only care to predict really well the known ratings. If I set lambdas to be very high, then I won't care so much about predicting well, but I will care about making latent factors small, like weights to be tiny. And if I have tiny weights, then I cannot make big mistakes. That's the idea, okay? Um, one thing to note, is that I can allow myself to make this type of transformation. What I mean by that is I don't care about what is the absolute value of this function. I care about P and Q that minimize this function. So I don't care whether this, the value of this entire function is 27 or 38. I don't care. I just care what are the P and Q that solve this function, that minimize it, okay? So that's an important point. So now let me try to tell you What's the idea with this regularization? Why do I want it? The idea is the following. If you think I have a user, and uh, you can think of our error term, and the way our, our objective function is, we have this predictive error term, and then we have this length term, right? And the predictive error in some sense says, um, for this user over the movies that the user rated, what, you know, how well am I able to make the prediction? And then the, the length term tells me how far from the coordinate origin is that user. And what will happen is that if there is a lot of movies here that the user rated, then this sum of the errors will be big because it will have a lot of terms. And, and because I will have a lot of terms here, this means that the length term will become kind of overweighted and will, will optimize for the good predictive accuracy. But if I have a user only, let's say, rated one movie, then, you know, the most error I can do here is, I don't know, 25, right? It's 
you know, I predict zero, um, but the user rated it five. So the, the, the total weight of the error term will be relatively small, so the length term will take over. And what the length term will want to do is it'll want to take this user and push it closer to the coordinate origin, right? So basically the idea is that if I have a lot of data about the user, then this error term for that user will become important, and it will take a lot of importance. But if I have little data about the user, only one or two ratings, then this length term will, will kind of have higher uh, magnitude. And what this means is that it will start pulling the, the user close to the coordinate origin, right? So it will kind of, the user will move closer. So that's the intuition, right? If you have a lot of data, then some of these square errors will add up and you will want to keep this low. And this will kind of overweigh the length term. But if in this here you have very few terms, then the, the length will take over and push the, the user closer to the coordinate origin. And that's the idea for regularization is that you want to you wanna be conservative. You want to have the weights, the coordinates for the user to be small. So we want them to be close to the origin. But you also want to fit well. So where you have a lot of data, this term will take over. And where you don't have data, this guy will take over. Exactly. And then the same reasoning goes for movies. Exactly the same reasoning goes for movies, right? The same thing happens. OK, good. Um, any questions? So now we know what regularization is doing. And we know how to, um, um, uh, uh, why we want it. So now I want to give you one more idea, which turns out to be very, very important. And essentially, you can think of it the following way. Machine learning is about optimization. And then, you know, there is a workhorse optimization method that is by far the most popular and the most useful. And this method is called stochastic gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent is very similar to gradient descent but just with a small difference, right? So I want to now explain what, what the difference is, right? We are trying to solve uh, this equation up here where, you know, we want to find P and Q that minimize this long uh, objective function. How we would, would we do this in gradient descent? We would, let's say, initialize P and Q by doing SVD on it, you know, pretend the missing ratings are zero, and then we do the gradient descent where we take current estimate of P, uh, make an update, to get the new estimate, take the current estimate of Q, make the ba gradient-based update to, to uh, update Q and keep iterating this, right? And then, you know, what is the gradient? The gradient is the, uh, the derivative of, of uh, the matrix Q, right? So for a particular entry I, F of Q, here's the formula how this gradient would look like, right? It is the error term as we had it before, plus the derivative of the regularization term, right? So I have two times lambda, and then uh, um, uh, and then the, the particular entry if, because I'm taking derivative with, with the entry if. And the only thing when you take these derivatives is, the only thing you need to remember is that derivative of the constant is zero, right? So if I'm taking the derivative with respect to if, then you know some if plus one, the derivative of that is zero with respect to if. And that's all you need to do. Uh, is it possible that this might run into issues if our estimates aren't very good? G good questions. Uh, it's a great point. So the way we are doing this uh, um, uh, uh, P and Q updates, this is called coordinate ascent or descent, where we basically keep one fixed and update the others. And we are doing this kind of alternate minimization going back and forth. And the reason we do it this way is because the problem is non-convex. But because we initialize it using SVD, that's already quite good it's in initialization, so we don't get stuck. But it's an excellent point. Okay? Um, one, one, one observation here is when you compute the gradient, notice I need to go through the entire training data set. So I need to go over 100 million entries here to compute the gradient uh, of my matrix Q. Uh, and that's a lot and very slow. So what does stochastic gradient descent do? It essentially tries to get a stochastic estimate of the gradient. Rather than computing the gradient precisely, it computes some noisy estimate of the gradient and makes a step. 
right? So the idea is everything is kind of written in this top equation where you notice that I have this blue summation over all i and x, so basically over the entire training data set. So the way I can think of this is that my gradient uh, of the, you know, matrix Q or a particular entry of matrix Q is the sum over the training data set plus some terms. And now I can take these terms and, you know, write it, write it uh, like this. I say this is the sum of the gradient with respect to the rating of user X on uh, item I, where here the sum goes over all uh, uh, user X item I uh, pairs, right? So if now I say, how does the gradient descent update look like? I said, the new Q is the old Q plus the update. So I can rewrite new Q is the old Q uh, uh, minus the update. And the way the update is, is the eta plus uh, the way I wrote it up there, right? The summation times the gradient. And what is the idea? The idea is to essentially get rid of this summation, right? So rather in my gradient descent, my update looks like this, where here is the summation over the training data to compute the gradient. I'm now throwing this summation out and I say, here is my update, right? I'm saying my old Q is my uh, a gradient of the Q with respect to the single rating, and I do the update, okay? And um, why, why, why do I care about this, right? Notice now that my estimate of the, of the Q is not over the entire data set, it's over one rating. So it's very noisy, but this, I can do a lot of quick updates using this. So in general, this will converge much faster than this thing, right? It will take more steps, but each step is much, much cheaper than up here. And just to say what people usually do in practice is that they do this in what is called mini batches, where you would compute this over not some, you know, one rating, but let's say you would have a summation here over 100 ratings. Compute the gradient, do the step. Take another 100, compute this, do the step. And that's what you would do. And to show you pictorially how does this look like, if you say, here is the number of iterations versus what is my value of the objective function? What is my sum of the squared errors? If you do gradient descent, then you are guaranteed that this error will keep going down. If you do stochastic gradient descent, because your estimate of the gradient is noisy, you are kind of dancing around. Generally, you go down, but sometimes you will make steps in the wrong direction. It will take you many more steps to or updates to converge, but the thing is that these steps are so dumb easy that you will do a lot of steps in the time you need, you do one step here. So in general, this will converge much, much faster. And, you know, another way to think of it, here's the, here's the picture. You know, if you want to get down to the, to the bottom of this hole, gradient descent will kind of nicely, carefully descend and stochastic gradient will kind of dance around, but eventually will hit the bottom. And generally, stochastic gradient will hit, hit the bottom faster because it's using simpler, faster uh, updates. I will skip this, but here is how you implement this and uh, you guys will digest this uh, for the homework, okay? Um, and if you do this for the real Netflix data and you do the two factors, here are the locations of the movies, right? And you see that, you know, movies that are kind of similar or have certain things in common, they tend to be put in the similar part of the space, right, um, for this particular case. So what I want to do now is um, I want to quickly continue and tell you about how do you extend this latent factor model to include biases, and then I'll finish with the summary of the, of the Netflix challenge. So here is what we decided to do, right? We said we'll have the user bias, we'll have the movie bias, and then we'll have this user movie interactions, right? And the way we said this is, we'll come up with this uh, overall mean rating, bias of the user, bias of the movie, this is here uh, on the left. And then we said, we'll also worry about the user movie um, interactions. Now, as I mentioned before, our baseline predictor is, you know, I wanna take the global average, um, and then, you know, based on the deviation of the user, and based on, on the deviation of the item, I can, uh, um, I can make uh, my predictions. Rather than 
actually using these deviations uh, and computing them from averages, I can actually go and just um, and just uh, train these things, right? So I can say the rating of user X on item I is the overall mean rating, bias for user X, bias for movie I, plus this user movie interaction term, my SVD term, if you like, my latent factor term, right? Um, and the same way as we did before, right? I say mean rating is 3.7, you know, the user uh, X is a critical person, so their mean rating is one star below, so, you know, BX is minus one, but, you know, Star Wars is a good movie, so it's rated half a star above the average, and, you know, I would just add these things together to get the baseline estimate for that user. And then that I have the baseline estimate, I could also use the user movie interaction term from the latent factor model to further update this value. And what is the, what is the idea? The idea now is that kind of we won't go and uh, actually only estimate P and Q, but we'll also go and estimate BX and BI, okay? So what I just did is I said this baseline, uh, these deviations, baselines, BX and BI, they are not computed based on averaging, but I will learn them from the data. And, you know, now, so what did I do? I wrote now a much bigger optimization problem where I want to figure out uh, P, Q, BI, BX, I regularize Q, I regularize P, I regularize BX, and I regularize BI, okay? And then I can do stochastic gradient descent, where now I will train for all these different parameters. Yes? Great, how do I interpret B, B and A, B terms B? They are in some sense biases. How do we interpret them? We don't care because we just want low error, right? To be like super blunt, maybe too blunt, right? And if you say, how well does this do? Here is the thing, right? We were doing basic collaborative filtering. We had collaborative filtering with learned weights, interpolation weights. We were at 0.91. Uh, basic latent factors give you 0.9, so it works better. If you do latent factors plus learned biases, so you learn this beast, you get at 0.98. Uh, sorry, 8.9. We're still away, but we are doing quite well. So let me now, in the last 10 minutes, tell you how do you close this gap. Okay? So this is where we are right now. We are doing really well, right? So we should keep going. Okay? So this is the challenge. This Netflix challenge had these six years of data from 2000 to 2005, and the challenge was running for three years um, with thousands of teams participating. So one thing when you build things and when you want to, uh, and when you model data, it's extremely important to look at the data. So one breakthrough that happened is that people were plotting, uh, you know, what is the average rating over time, right? Here is time in days. And this is the average, uh, the average rating. And what they noticed is that uh, uh, sometime in 2004, the average rating suddenly increases, right? And people explain this by saying, oh, Netflix make, made some improvements, the user interface got better, uh, the way the ratings were given changed and so on. But there was this discontinuity in 2004, right? Something changed. Nobody was modeling change of the rating over time. They noticed it and said, oh, now we mo have to model the, the, the change of the rating over time. Another thing they noticed is that users tend to prefer new movies without any reason. And older movies are generally just inherently better than the new ones, right? So the old movies uh, uh, ratings tend to increase over time. Again, some pattern in data that if you wouldn't look at the data, you, you would never know you need to model. So what do you do? You make your model even bigger. The way you make it bigger is that you make this user bias and item bias term depend on time. And the way you make them depend on time is that you parameterize this uh, time dependency. And essentially, the way you do it is that you split the time in bins. And uh, for every 10 bin interval, you train a separate B, okay? So now B depends on time because I took the time, I split it in bins, and for every bin, I have a separate parameter, 
okay? Um, and uh, you do this uh, temporal dependence to the uh, item biases, and then you do the same thing for uh, user biases, but here we actually do it for every day separately, okay? So now we have a separate parameter for every user for every day. How well does this work? If you add latent factors plus biases plus this time component, you get to 0.76, right? So uh, you, you gain quite a lot, right? Um, we are still away from the, from the, um, uh, from the prize. So what, what people then do is they get desperate and they try something that is called a kitchen sink approach, okay? So how does a kitchen sink look like? You just throw a lot of stuff into it and hope it will work, right? So what did they do? Like, so up to here, um, this, uh, these models uh, uh, are working really well. From here, things will get a bit desperate, right? So what, do they, what they did is they come up with, I think, around uh, 300 different recommender systems. And then these 300 systems made about 500 different predictions for the same user movie plot. And then they came up with a way how you take these dif different predictors, blend them together into another set of predictors, and then further blend the blends together to another 30 predictors, and then add all these 500 plus 200 plus 30 predictors to make the final prediction, right? And if you do that, as kind of decadent as it is, you get where you want to be. You get a 10.09% improvement over the baseline, okay? So um, this is how uh, these guys uh, got it, right? So this is the leaderboard on, on that particular day when, you know, uh, the Belcor team, before they were called um, uh, just Belcor, this is uh, the latent factors and stuff, then they started adding more, in this, more of these models and they renamed themselves into Belcore in big chaos. And then, you know, the last one with 700 predictors is Belcore's pragmatic chaos. And the pragmatic chaos got them across the line. Okay? So what happens now um, is that a, that a 30 day countdown period starts, right? Whenever the first person, the first team crosses this line, the other teams have one month to, uh, to submit their final solutions. And whoever is on the top after 30 days after this moment, they win, okay? So um, what now happened is essentially is that all these other teams grouped together to go after the Belcor pragmatic chaos, right? So all the other teams formed another team that they called uh, a, 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 an ensemble, right? So they just grouped themselves together, uh, all together, uh, they, com they relied on combining their predictions and they also very quickly got over the 10% improvement mark. So now we have two teams uh, competing with each other, right? The Belcore team was, they were making small improvements using their scores and they quickly realized they are in direct competition with this team ensemble. Um, and this was very interesting because kind of both teams were carefully monitoring the leaderboard. And the only way to check whether your model works well is to submit your predictions. And then what Netflix would do, it would evaluate your predictions and it would update the leaderboard. But by updating the leaderboard, you let the other team know that you have a better score. So the other team would work even harder to beat you. So they were trying to be careful about this, right? And, and they had 30 days and they could only make one submission per day. And then they had this last 24 hours. This is what they did. Um, they, submissions, as I said, were limited to one a day. Um, and 24 hours uh, before the deadline, the Belcore team had a member in uh, Austria who notices that Ensemble just beat them and they are now the leader, like only 24 hours before the deadline. So in the last 24 hours, both teams kind of uh, work on their uh, final optimizations. And they very carefully kind of calibrated their workload so that they would finish about an hour before the deadline, okay? And then what Belcor decided to do is they decided to submit whole 40 minutes before the deadline. And then the ensemble team needed to, you know, submit at 20 minutes before the deadline, right? When this 30 day window runs out. Um, and then, you know, both team were, teams were waiting 
who will win. Uh, here are the results, right? What actually happened is that they both scored the same score, right? But you know who who won? It's the Belcor team that won. And uh, here's the here's the check they received, right? But this really has uh, you know kind of one important uh, uh, um, more, uh, how to say uh, teaching the thing the lesson that you can learn. The rest the lesson re is right submit early, right? So so really they they won by submitting 40 minutes before the deadline and the other team submitted 20 minutes before the deadline. They matched the score, but whoever submitted first won, right? So uh, this is how the million dollars was awarded, by a 20 minutes difference in submission. So uh, here is some super interesting reading that you can read about how this competition went. Uh, there is lots of very good papers that resulted out of this. And maybe one thing I will say before we finish is that in these recommender systems, what is very important is that you are very careful with regularization. At the end, it turns out that the winning, winning model had a billion parameters, right? So you have a billion parameters with 100 million data points. So you can overfit as much as you like. So what turns out to be very important is those um, 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 regularization weights, those lambdas, that you tweak those carefully, that you limit your model's expressive power, even though the number of parameters can be huge, right? So I'd invite you to kind of follow up and read a bit more about this because it really pushed the recommender system's lead research a lot. Yes? What do you do now where like almost all Netflix users don't create movies? Is this a while ago and now like with streaming, people tend to just be like bitwise watched or didn't watch, you don't really know if they like the movie or not. So how do you get around like I guess extracting what they like? Great, great, great point, right? So there is one big assumption we made here. And the assumption is that these ratings are given to us. And really we said recommender system problem, we transformed it into predicting ratings, right? And then, you know, everything is good and, you know, academics like competitions and off they go, right? But in the real sen setting, as you said, you, don't, ha you not, don't generally have this nice label, right? So what do you do is that you kind of try to get these implicit labels, right? Implicit label would be, did, the, did they finish the movie? It's not maybe the best thing, but did they finish it? If they didn't finish it, obviously the movie was not good enough, right? So you can use, or, you know, did they cancel the subscription, right? If they cancel the su subscription, whatever they watched, they probably felt they didn't get enough value out of it, right? So you can use this type of signals as labels for you to learn. But to say this question about where do the labels come from is actually the most important where you are deciding to to, to build things like this and bring in this technology. It's really about what is the signal, the, the feedback from the user. Is it explicit signal or is it implicit? And last, on Tuesday, right, Michele, at the beginning of the lecture, talked about how can you collect this rating data because that's very important. Um, good. Let's finish here. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next week.